we're here for.
the other side of the river. Trenton here was an hour and south and much of the area this morning for hydro work. Uh, we pray, Lord, and be with them that they'll be able to uh, uh, have the heat of their homes that they need and be able to get meals that needed. And uh, just ask, Lord, that you'll just be with uh, any that are over on that side of the river and not able to uh, live and have normal activities today. Lord, we pray for the community around the boat. Oh, how our hearts go out to those who do not know you. Ask, Lord, that you'll help us to be channels through which you can work to touch lives and draw them onto yourselves that they might come to know the joys of salvation. What peace it gives to have Christ in our hearts. What turmoil it is for those who do not have you. So we pray for them. Pray for those who do not pray for themselves, that your spirit will touch them and give them a hunger for Christ and righteousness and true holiness. We pray, Lord, for the world situation, these wars that are going on, especially that trouble in the Middle East that seems to be escalating and just pray, Lord, that somehow you'll intervene there and that there'll be uh, stop to all this loss of life there, especially the innocent people that are not really involved in the war and just want to be going about their normal activities and yet uh, never know when they might just have a bomb or a missile or something hit their place. But Lord, we pray for them. We pray for those in Ukraine and with the battle going on there and other parts of the world. We pray, Lord, you'll be with our missionaries around the world, but particularly those that are in those uh, troubled areas, that you will give them the added grace and the added strength that they need for the heavier load of uh, working with uh, displaced people and other desperate needs at this time. We're so thankful, Lord, that our church does have uh, work with churches in uh, all those most of those areas, particularly where the pain wars seem to be going on, and strengthen our Christian believers there, our church and other believers, believers of other Christian churches, uh, to stand firm in the midst of the turmoil and be lights in the darkness there. Lord, we do pray for our churches across the district, and uh, today we pray for the young folk, uh, Spanish church in Hamilton, thankful for that church, the way it's growing, and uh, pray, Lord, you'll give them, provide them with a permanent uh, place for, for worship, instead of their temporary place now, and just pray, Lord, that you will provide that and use them as a lighthouse for Spanish-speaking people throughout the Hamilton the city and area above. Bless their pastor and the people that labor there. Now, Lord, uh, continue to direct us as we continue to worship you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we set cause with this time, and our offering, our offering text for today is uh, taken from Second Chronicles, chapter thirty-one, and verse eighteen, verse twelve, rather. Says they faithfully brought in the offering, the tithe, <coughs> and the dedicated thing, and. They faithfully did it in the Old Testament. How much more we need to faithfully do it in our day when we have the gospel of Jesus Christ added to what they had back there and how much he means to us. What a privilege it is to share in this way. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. Most of all, the spiritual blessings but yes, the material blessings too. For we are such a blessed people in this land. We really have
have no real love. Maybe a lot of things we think we want, but you have supplied us so abundantly. So, Lord, we count it a privilege to be able to present a portion of it back to you at this time. Amen.
from 1 Peter chapter 2. First epistle of Peter, chapter 2, beginning to read at the first verse. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies <coughs> and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone is allowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up spiritual, a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them that stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which has not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Read to the end of the tenth verse of this passage of God's Word. And we'll look at it again in a little while after we sing another song. The last song for the uh, message this morning is Because He Lives. And uh, growing up, my, my dad used to say this phrase quite a bit, that uh, there's only two things in life that are certain, death and taxes. Well, there's a third thing, yeah. and that is our Lord and Savior, amen? Not, not knocking you, Dad, that was a good statement. Oh, right. <laughs> but are we thankful this morning that we have the certainty that God's not going anywhere. He's got us in his, in his hands. You know, it might not feel like it. We might not know the timing of how he's going to work or how he's going to work, but we know that he will. Amen? Stand with us this morning and pray. God said,
because if we can say, He lives. Because He lives, we shall live also. That's the wonderful promise of God. Praise His name. Well, the end of this week, I think it's Friday, Thursday maybe, is Reformation Day. He that pardoned Luther many years ago had his 95 thesis, as he called it, ideas that he had regarding the reform needed in the church of that day onto the uh, door of the church in Wittenberg and sparked what we know as the Protestant Reformation. And what a joy it is to have that. Sometimes we try to take some of these things for granted, you know. The freedom we have of uh, religion. But it wasn't always that way. And there was a very dark time in Christian history when Martin Luther was growing up. And God used him to bring about the Reformation. And so uh, today, like to look at that. The uh, Protestant Church has many branches. That's okay. Some people don't think it is. They think it should be all one together. But uh, we're not all the same people. And I like to joke uh, that way sometimes with people, you know, if uh, they say, well, we should all be together. I said, well, uh, uh, should we all be very formal, using a prayer book for you? Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't want that. <laughs> uh, well, should we be just completely free and everybody shouting and doing whatever they like, you know, and worship that way? Well, no, no, that. <laughs> well, where, where should we be? Or it's usually what they mean, they should all be like me or our church, you know, whatever denomination that happens. But I, I believe it is in God's uh, direction because we are all different. We do have different churches, yeah. uh, different uh, denominations. Praise Him, as long as it's truly seeking and praising the Lord. I'm not talking about those that are way off and there's enough of them to. But uh, Protestants are people that believe in the Bible and Word of God. They're not just uh, uh, protesters, <coughs> not people who protest, but that have a belief. So let's look at the three beliefs of Protestantism, which uh, possibly the main one. It came out of Luther's work in the Reformation. First of all, the authority of the Bible. The Bible is precious to us. I hope we have a desire for it, to, to read it, to study it, not to worship it. We're not worshiping the Bible, but we have a desire to worship the God of the Bible. And that uh, desire directed. In the second verse of that passage we read, 1 Peter 2, verse 2, says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Newborn babe desires its milk and demands it, doesn't it? Now you're made. <laughs> it wants these, you better pay attention or you're not going to get much rest yourself. <laughs> but, uh, do we have that desire for the Word of God? Do we really want it? That's the desire that God wants in our heart. And Luther recognized that because in his day, uh, the Bible was uh, chained to a desk. Uh, we have a Bible here. It's not chained to anything. It uh, can easily be moved, and we do from time to time for communion or whatnot. Uh, but uh, in those days it would be changed so nobody could take it away because it stayed in the 
church. People couldn't have their own Bible. And there's places in the world today where they can. But uh, most places uh, where the gospel of Jesus Christ is penetrated all over this world, they have the Bible. And we try to get it in the language of the people. I don't know how many languages now, the Bible Society and so on, but the uh, information that the uh, Bible is now translated in X number of different languages and uh, other uh, uh, working on others or there's parts of it in and it's a great thing for people to have the Bible in their own language. Not have to depend on someone else to, to read it to them and explain it and probably have it in a language that they didn't understand anyway. And Lucifer thought that's not right. That the people could not have the Word of God. He was able to have it because at the monk in the monastery uh, they would study it. So they could tell the people what was in it. He said that's not right. We should have the Bible. And so that became one of the uh, tenets of the Protestant Reformation. The Bible is sufficient for uh, all our needs of, for salvation. We don't have to uh, add anything to it. That's what most of the cults you run into, it's a good way to tell what some of them are cults, is that they have a separate book to it. They either replace the Bible, like the Muslims, of course, have the Quran, but the cults often guide to well, the, uh, the Bible and the Book of Mormon, or the Bible and the writings of the Mary Baker Eddy, or the Bible and this or that, or, or their literature that they bring around. They add it to it. We're not satisfied with that. But the Bible itself is all we need for salvation and guidance in life. No need of extra traditions or additions. There's a place for a tradition. We all have our, our traditions, and sometimes more so than we recognize and want to admit, but but we do. Uh, and even in our worship, the way that we worship uh, used to be that you could pretty well tell you go into a church if you didn't see the name on the door or didn't know what church it was, say you were visiting on holidays or something, and so you went to church that was happened to be there. A little bit into the service, you knew what, you could tell what church it was, what kind it was. Nowadays, we seem to be all doing the same thing. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But it's hard to tell one from the other. But uh, there's, uh, there's traditions that we, we have. But there is not part of our need for salvation. We don't depend on our traditions. That was a problem back in the days of Luther before the Reformation that uh, they went by tradition. And there are those churches today that and put more emphasis on tradition than on the simplicity of the gospel. And uh, you would hear the name of them, but that could be some. But uh, the gospel churches, the Protestant churches, do not depend on tradition, although we have a certain amount. But uh, we're not dependent. We depend on the Bible. What does God's Word have to say today? <clears throat> and it is one's guide to the Christian life. Look at what uh, Paul wrote to uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse uh, 16. He said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The adequacy of the scripture of the Bible comes from God, as it says there, 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Doesn't say he gave the exact word. Some believe in verbal or literal translation, but uh, uh, that could be some passages. But the Bible says God inspired people to to write the word of God. It's given by inspiration of God. And so it's from God, it's for mankind. It says that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That covers a lot of area, doesn't it? Then the things we really need, you know, is it given for them? direct us. Not something to argue over or something like that, but given to to help us, to give us some a direction that is profitable for that. To know the doctrine. Is it my Bible doctrine? Is it somebody else's idea? For reproof, for correction. Sometimes we don't like that, but it does. Sometimes, you know, people say, well, sometimes when I read the Bible, I say, uh, amen, and sometimes I say, ouch. <laughs> well, sometimes we need to say, ouch, a little bit, don't we? It's for correction. It wants us on the right foot. We need corrections in life, don't we? We get driving somewhere, and uh, we make a wrong turn. We need correction. How do we get back? Right. And uh, if you have this GPS, and you might, that might tell you how to <coughs> turn now. Maybe it's telling you something. Well, now you made the wrong turn. So it says, well, now go this way, that way, walk out, and you'll get back to the lost, hopefully. But uh, we need correction in life in many ways. And, and so the Bible is there to, to give us that, that, that correction, to show us the way. And uh, instruction in righteousness. How ought we to live? According to what uh, the neighbor says? According to what some of society says? No, oh, I think that could get us into a lot of trouble. But the Bible gives <coughs> us direction. Instructions in righteousness. We want a righteous life. Well, in the proper way, we need the Bible. And so, the Reformation said the Bible should be in the hands of the people. <coughs> that was a purpose, of course. Verse 17 there, as it says that the man of God, the person of God, have to be careful nowadays, <laughs> but uh, the person of God may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's what the Bible says. <coughs> oh, society tells us all the bad things that people can do and uh, enticement to do it, that Satan behind it. But the Bible help, tells us to share this unto all good works. The Bible is to be accepted. Not debated. Oh, I know you can discuss it and, and do it in a Bible study sometimes to discuss the Bible and certain passages here and there get different ideas perhaps of it, but it's not to be debated. It's not, well, uh, is it right or wrong? It's accepted. It's, our, it's God's Word. Everything needs to be judged by the Bible. Not the reverse. So many people seem to have that idea that the Bible is to be judged by society and by my opinion and uh, some of those things. No. It's not to be judged. It's there to judge us. To be accepted. Not to be. And so the Bible, the authority of the Bible, the freedom to have the Bible. It's one of the great tenets of the Reformation. It was because people did not have that before. 
the authority with the priest, the Bible was only for them, not for people. Aren't you glad that we're Protestants? We have the Word of God freely with us. And today, in so many different translations, I'm telling you, I think that gets overdone a bit, but certain ones couldn't understand it then. And uh, I, even with our own congregation, I have some people say, well, I do such and such a version because it seems clearer to me. And somebody else says, well, I use another version. Well, as long as it's a good, accurate version, that's the main thing. Some of the paraphrases I'm not sure about, but uh, the Bible, in the language of the people. That's what Luther called. And so he translated it into German. So the people wouldn't have to learn Latin in order to read the Bible. And so we have. And then the next uh, uh, foundation of Protestantism is justification by faith. And uh, we'll go to a verse in uh, Romans that Luther came across. He was struggling to uh, find salvation, punishing himself. And there are some places where they still do that. I remember one time we were trip down to in the Quebec there, and one place there and saw the church with the long steps going up to it, and there were people going up there a step at a time, not walking like I would, but on their knees. I guess they were offering a prayer, and they had their prayer beads or whatnot, and uh, each step they paused, and then they walked and kneel on the next step. I don't know how long it took them to get up there, but uh, that was their way of coming to God. They were <laughs> and so, People are bound. And Lucifer was bound by that type of thing in his day and his breath when he was brought up and he was uh, punishing himself. And he said that he even beat his own flesh, beat himself, bruised himself, thinking that would get the devil out and, and whatnot and become more. But then, one day in his study, he came across this verse. The part of this verse in Romans 1 17, where it says, The just shall live by faith. Very simple statement, isn't it? Just short words, four or five letters, a couple of letters, more, three. Simple. But it struck him like a thunderbolt. The just shall live by faith. All this that I've been going through, all this punishment, all this tradition, all that I've been trying to do to feel the justice face of God, it's all wrong. We don't get it that way. We get it by faith. The just shall live by faith. And that's the strength of Protestantism, even today. Some of those old churches, such as the one that uh, Luther came out of, are, are still teaching a lot of works and doing things to gain your salvation. Light candles, paying indulgences, all, all these things. But salvation cannot be earned by any of those things. By our works or ritual. Oh yes, it's good to practice it. Good to be in church. I mean, Pastor was talking to a man one day about his need to make a decision for Christ. And he said, well, uh, I, uh, I made it, but I go to church every week. The pastor said, or he said, I'm in church every week. And the pastor said, yes, so is the devil. <laughs> It's not a matter of that. Now, it's good to be in church. I wish more people in our society today would, would get that point of view. That uh, we need to be in the fellowship of God's people. But that doesn't save our souls. If we're depending on that, we're lost. But uh, losers discovered that we're saved by faith, justified by faith. It's the only way. And I like the 
the idea there. It doesn't say, at least in the version that I became the version, I'm the author. The just shall live by faith. It doesn't say by his faith or their faith. I live by faith. To me, that has a dual meaning. It's our faith, yes, but it's also the faith of God. When Jesus Christ came down to this earth and went to that cross to be crucified and suffered there, why did he do it? He did it because he had faith that we would accept that atonement for our sins. Accept the price that he paid. He had faith that we would do it. Otherwise, I'm sure he wouldn't have done it. Can you imagine going through all that if you were just thinking, well, people aren't going to pay any attention anyway? No. He had faith in you and me, the folks on the internet watching online, and all those neighbors around about us that don't care for God or righteousness or holiness or any of those things, he still had faith that they some of them would accept it. He had faith. He had faith in you. If you read that position, if you haven't, he paid the price because he had faith that you would come. And also, of course, we need the faith in God to come. That's what we usually emphasize. We do not come by works or tradition. We come by Faith. You know, rather simple illustration. You know, a lot of people nowadays use uh, these gift cards. These here, sometimes they don't know what to buy a person, so you give them a gift card. When they give you that card, the gift card, they have faith that you're going to use it. Say it's, uh, well, that's a person. Activity we had in the place last week. Among the things that was going around uh, was uh, the gift, you know, a couple of gift cards. And I know I got one of them for Canadian Fire. Now, the person that put that uh, gift card in for the circulation, I don't think was th th thinking of just giving a donation to Canadian Fire. No, they had faith that whoever got that gift card would use it and get the value of it. I mean, you don't buy a gift card just because you want to make a donation to Green Tart or Walmart or Fresh Co or something like that. No. You buy that to give the person so that they will use it. If they don't use it, your money's wasted. Well, unless can, Canadian Tire really needed that 25 bucks, you know, <laughs> I don't think they do. It's wasted. But they had faith that we do. And Jesus had faith that we would receive his salvation. He paid the price for it. And that that what is that he shed on that cross is wasted. If we don't accept it, because there's no other way. You see, we try to find other ways. If we don't use a gift card, we can use a, our own credit card or cash or something. But we're still wasting that credit card. And whatever type of thing we might try to use instead of faith in Christ, it's wasted. Indulgences and all those things that they've done in that day, and some of those churches still do. Wasted. Wasting the blood of And then this faith. Because justification is by faith, it's available to all. Not just the rich or the poor, not just the highly intelligent or the rather ignorant. Not the handsome or the, I could say ugly, that 
might be too strong a term to make for anybody, but no. It's available to all. That's the good news of the gospel. <laughs> Look at the end of that second verse again in uh, first the Peter there that we read earlier. Second part of uh, verse 6 there says uh, uh, that and he believed on him shall not be confounded. Not be disappointed. A lot of people are disappointed in life. Some of them rightfully so. But we won't be disappointed when we accept God's word by faith. Accept him by faith. Or justified by faith. No. It says that the elect precious that believe in him shall not be confounded, not be disappointed. We can rely on God. The provision for all. That's good news for us, but it's good news for others. We can share that news with others that Jesus paid the price for all. They can put their faith in him. It's not limiting. But it's the individual responsibility to receive that by faith. And then a third uh, tenet of Protestantism is the priesthood of believers. Second Timothy again, as we're reading there, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A royal priesthood. We're all priests in that sense. We can all go to God directly. Now, we as Protestants take that for granted pretty much, although it seems to be breaking down in some areas. But uh, unlike the uh, day of a new servant lived, that uh, you had to depend on the priest to, to take your prayers to, to God, you know. So you lit a candle or something to have the priest say it certain prayer for you or for a loved one that might be lost or have died or something like that. Priests did the praying. People didn't pass. They didn't have access to God. That's not what, what they were taught. Had to go through the priest. But we should believe, discover, and uh, we live by it today, that any of us can go directly to Jesus Christ in prayer. We don't need somebody to pray for us. Now it's good to have others pray for us, and uh, we do from time to time. Somebody's sick, we call for different church to pray for them. And that's fine. I'm always glad when somebody will bring a need to me. Not that I'm looking for them to have trouble, but if they have the need that someone's asked for prayer for, yes. We pray for one another. But the fact is that any of us can pray for others, and any of us can pray for our own needs, take them to God, and leave them there in God's hands and trust Him. We don't have to go through someone else. We're not dependent on priests, but on Jesus Christ only. And that's way we, we give an altar call in our churches, we usually say, come and pray. We don't say, come and I'll pray for you. Uh, I don't know what's going on in some of our camp meetings, but where they get some of their evangelists, but I find some of these fellows after the church, they'll say, well, now, if you want prayer, you come up and I'll pray for you. And so you have a line of people standing there waiting for the evangelist to pray for them. Well, to me, that's going back Poor Luther there. You have to get somebody else. Yeah? 
Right? If somebody comes forward to pray and uh, that evangelist or whoever can help them if they want prayer, you know, we think it's good sometimes to let the person do their own praying and just be available if they want help. But rather than to sort of, uh, well, uh, I'll do the praying for you. No. We're all priests. We all take our work needs to God. That's part of being a Protestant. That's what the Lucia discovered and passed on to the various Protestant denominations ever since. We're free to pray. We're free to choose. But we're responsible for our choices. Responsible to God for the choices we make. And we can do this. We make our choice. I've made my choice forever. I will live for Christ my Lord. As, a, as the priest of the gospel, to share the gospel with others. It's not just for the evangelist, the missionary, the pastor, the Sunday school teacher. All of us have a responsibility to share the gospel in whatever way we can, with whomever we can, wherever we can, whenever we can, to spread the gospel. Because we are all part of the priesthood of God. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a separated people, that he should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness onto his marvelous light. What a privilege. So let us be true to our Protestant faith. Belief in the Bible, justification by faith, and the priesthood of belief, and other minor things too, but that's all we have time for today. Not in name only. Don't want to be Protestants just in name only but in our actions and all that we are. Holding to and living by our basic beliefs as God's people, as Protestant Christians today. And we're going to sing today about standing on the promises of God. Before we do that, I know we usually do um, special presentations at the beginning of the service, but just uh, felt want to do this a little bit differently. So, in case uh, any of anybody here, anybody online doesn't know, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and so uh, Pastor, if you'd like to come down here, we have a little something for you. Funny that you should mention uh, gift cards in your sermon this morning, because <laughs> that's what we have for you. Um, we just appreciate everything you do to take care of us, so we just wanted to give you something to take care of yourself and uh, have something to enjoy. So thank you so much for everything you do. Well, thank you very much. And we appreciate the congregation and the privilege to serve here. Thank you.
Lord, we just thank you for the way that he's there. We just pray, Lord, that you would continue to um, keep him lifted up and encouraged, Lord. Um, just love the positive attitude that he brings. And Lord, we just ask for you to continue to work in, in his personal and spiritual life as well. And uh, we just appreciate everything he does. So thank you again, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.
as we walk with you. Go with us in our various walks of life. Have your way in our lives day by day. Amen. And for our fellowship time, Lord, we pray for your presence amongst us, and for your direction to us as we share one with another. Bless those who contributed the goodies that for us as we have this time of just getting to know each other a little better. Draw closer ever to you. 